Taking advantage of the pole position, Moffat leads up Mountain Straight with Bond skillfully maneuvering into second place ahead of Seaton and McPhee. Speculation about Ford's tactics is rife. There are those who feel Moffat will attempt to break up the field, especially as he's backed up by McPhee and Seaton. But the majority are convinced he'll drive only as fast as the dictates of the race demand. <laughs> Flashing down Conrad for the first time, Moffat is trailed by Seaton and Bond. In the braking area, Bond pulls out to easily gather in Moffat and Seaton and takes the lead as he negotiates the left-hander into pit straight. Sensing a battle in the David Goliath mold, the huge crowd acclaims Bond as he speeds past the pits, his XU1 going perfectly. But Moffat and Seaton use a little more thrust to keep him within reach as they again head up the mountain. Five laps, Moffat regains the overall lead. Resisting Bond's challenge to an early duel, Moffat instead concentrates on pre-race set speeds. Maintaining the form that took him to success in the Tasman series at Warwick Farm and the Sandown 3R race prior to Bathurst, Moffat's control and handling is giving him scope to virtually dominate the 500. Even at such an early stage, it seems only bad luck could rob him of victory. Especially as it's now obvious McPhee is splendidly playing the role of backup driver. Bond makes an unscheduled pit stop due to carburetor trouble. Meanwhile, the Brock Morris XU1 moves into second place. Excitement surrounds Moffat's first scheduled pit stop after 45 laps. As new tyres are being fitted on the GTHO and fuel replenished by a well-drilled pit crew, Des West's four-barrel pacer flashes past to take over the lead. But Alterna is unperturbed. We've made our first stop in the, with Bruce McPhee and it took two minutes and nine seconds to change three tires and we put in 25 gallons of fuel. We've got Moffat fueled up again with four tires and, and 25 gallons and they're both out now. And uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. Brock comes in and hands the wheel over to 21 years old Bob Morris competing in his third 500. The West Brown Valiant pits for a scheduled stop and loses the lead. In fact, time consumed during the stop puts the pacer back into pit place overall, but it still holds a comfortable class lead. Bond makes up lost time improving several places to be in the first ten, but is again forced into the pits, this time with valve trouble. To clear the pit area, the XU-1 is taken off the track, putting Bond virtually out of the race. McPhee is now second, with West a lap behind in fourth place. Morris comes in with similar symptoms to those of Bond's car. The car is in need of major repair. The Christine Cole Sandra Bennett car has a troublesome front tire, but it's not serious enough to put them out of the running for the ladies' trophy. Firmly entrenched as leader, Moffat is well in command, while McPhee holds a backup position in second place. Bonds Holden is going well again, but he's many laps behind. There's an atmosphere of calm confidence in the Ford camp. Their pit crew has been by far the fastest during stops, and Moffat is capitalizing on time saved. Doug Chiver's pacer is making leeway on the overall leaders, and barring accidents should be up there at the finish. Holland has to make another pit stop so that Chivers could then take over the lead in Class C, in which there's been only two retirements. Third placed overall, Holland pits. With some 30 laps to go, he changes to the new 350 faster compound Dunlop tyres, and these in fact improve his lap times by about three seconds.
Moffat has more than a lap advantage over Holland, so the XU1 faces an impossible task. Tapsell and Leighton still lead Class A. Roberts is improving his position and is in the same lap as the leader. The unruffled Moffat still restrains his knot, his fastest lap 2.55, being more than five seconds slower than his qualifying figures. The slow motion camera dramatically illustrates the skillful handling of the semi-flying cars through the S's. Lapping practically the whole field, Moffat's lead over McPhee has been narrowed as the Fords continue their dominance. Leader at one stage during the morning, West is now ninth overall. Moffat is right on schedule for his final pit stop during which the crew makes their fastest turnaround. They've taken no longer than 2 minutes 45 on any stop. But this one, with fuel and four tyres, is only two minutes, nine seconds. Moffat is cruising less than half a minute ahead of McPhee as the race reaches its closing stages. Roberts recaptures third place from Chivers with some attacking driving. But almost immediately after going over Skyline, Roberts' car spins and crashes backwards down a steep slope. Officials and spectators rush down to render assistance, but although the car is a write-off, fortunately Roberts is only dazed. Moffat rounds Forrest Elbow and heads for Conrod Strait for the last time. He leads McPhee and goes on to win from his teammate with Don Holland third, a lap behind. Ford's manager Al Turner gives credit to all in the Ford team. They drove exactly the way we wish them to drive. It's a team effort, it's been a team effort all the way through, and we're very proud of the result. But I, I, I must say this, I think it's firstly a, a, a credit to our product to do this, and secondly to the fine group of fellows that worked for me. I've got a tremendous group of young fellas and they've worked hard and they've done a tremendous job here in the pits today and I just can't say too much for them. Hardy Ferrodo, General Manager George Hibbert, presents the victor's laurel wreath and outright winner's plaque to a triumphant Moffat, following his marathon six hours, 34 minutes, 26 seconds at the wheel, beginning his racing career in Victoria and later continuing in Canada and the United States, Moffat returned to Australia early last year to become quickly established as a top driver and and master strategist. And that's how the 1970 Hardy Ferrodo was run and won. <laughs>